Hi there, welcome to Lecture 3-2, uh, The Cultural Dimensions of Environmental History, another one of the lectures that was uh, prepared by Mark Daly. And uh, we wanted you to be thinking about your process of composing a deep history within the larger context of the, the growing field of environmental history. And so as we start this conversation today, Mark, one of the things I was interested in, in mm -hmm. thinking about by stretching the environmental history, this deep history, over you know 250 million years so mm -hmm. that people know why their landscape is shaped the way that it is, one of the goals of that, that, um, that length of time is to make the human inhabitation seem relatively mm -hmm. minor mm -hmm. and to help us escape the um, anthropocentrism that mm -hmm. we often fall into, that we think the most interesting part of the history mm -hmm. of where we live is the human history. Mm -hmm. I wonder if as an anthropologist, somebody who mm -hmm. studies human cultures, uh, you have uh, any thoughts about um, how we can see humans as just one species among many mm -hmm. inhabiting a particular bioregion without slipping into the trap of anthropocentrism. Sure. Great, great questions and, and also important things to think about. And I think it's fun to think about these things. So hopefully the students enjoy this part and enjoy the reading and, and thinking about it. Um, both are necessary, I think. I think it's important and good to imagine our regions, our continents, our environments over incredibly long time spans, uh, including when they didn't have humans in them. And I think it's also critical to think about our landscapes when humans were in them and what role that had. But to answer your question more directly, how do we, what's the best, so what are some ways to think about landscapes from a non-anthropocentric perspective, one that doesn't put humans to the forefront as terribly special or unique? And I think um, ecology does that for us. I think that's what ecology is about. Ecology gives us the language, um, carrying capacity, fertility, mortality, nutrient and energy flows, feedback systems, and when you use the language and concepts of ecology, you um, bring humans in as any other species. And there are problems and issues with that to think about, but um, it allows us to talk about humans as if we are any other species, which of course we are. Um, and the other way, ecology is one way, the other way I think is evolutionary theory. Uh, we're, we wear fancy clothes and we drive cars and we have language, um, but we also are susceptible to natural selection Millions of people die each year from infectious disease. Um, we're still evolving uh, in terms of population. We're, we're like any other species in that we are also products of evolution and we're still evolving. So a quick answer to your question would be um, use ecology and use evolutionary theory. Um, I'll go on for one more second. Sure. And that is, uh, but I also would stop short. I would, we are special in some ways. We are unique in some ways in that we have what we call culture. Um, the ability to think symbolically, to use symbolic language, to be guided by deep metaphoric understandings, to learn quickly, not rely on mutations for beneficial adaptations, but to make it up quickly. And so I think culture is important. The, the mental world of humans is also important. And when we talk about environmental history, it's important to think of carrying capacity, nitrogen. I also think it's important to think about human ideas, whether it's religious belief, uh, um, ideas about nature. I think they are just as critical movers and shapers of an ecosystem as are energy and nutrients. So we can't forget ideas either. It's a, it's a good point, especially when we think about one of the uh, most important distinctions between humans and other species has to do with our ability to modify uh, an environment more so than any other species. Um, of course, people are always drawn to the analogy with the beaver, so, uh, right. another species who modifies his environment. But I, I'm wondering, uh, when we think about our own landscapes as uh, disturbed landscapes, uh, for the most part changed in some pretty fundamental ways by human disturbances, whether that's deforestation mm -hmm. replaced by a particular agri agricultural regime mm -hmm. or whatever it may be, how uh, can mm -hmm. our students try to um, balance the disturbed reality of their bioregions with the ecological potential capacity character of those right, bioregions? Right. Um, I guess that's a great question too. All these are good questions. I guess one thing I would try to do would be to avoid simple narratives of this was a pristine environment, low indigenous people were in harmony with it, then this screwed it up. And even um, you know the best environmental histories out there 
tell stories like this. And, well, it's, to some degree, it's true. There are some really rupturous transformational episodes. I guess what I'm trying to say is, to the to the most degree possible, keep yourself close to the ground of a narrative or story that pays attention to transformations without overlaying um, ideological judgments on them. So I guess one of the things is to avoid, start with smaller stories and build up. Um, don't start from uh, evil capitalism did this, evil white people did this, harmonious people were disturbed. Start with some of these ecological categories of landscape transformation that we had um, a mixed secessional landscape because of small populations, because of a mixed economy involving small-scale agriculture, hunting and gathering. When sugar plantations were introduced into the Caribbean, a mixed secessional force was cut down and it became um, arrested secession of intensive agriculture. Tell the story by particular details to that region um, and build up to a bigger story. Uh, so I guess, again, starting with ecology and the details of history. And if it builds into a bigger story, then it does. But I wouldn't um, assume grand narratives to, <laughs> to, to shape the story. Well, well, let me maybe end with a question that uh, exemplifies one of those grand narratives that seems uh -huh. to be gaining a lot of popularity now. Some of you may have heard, um, even Bill McKibben spoke about it, that we have now moved from the Holocene into something called the Anthropocene, uh -huh. a new epic in which um, things are so... Uh, modified by human activities that it really constitutes a distinct period mm -hmm. in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of this this move from Holocene to Anthropocene? And the follow-up question is, if we do buy the fact that we're now living in the Anthropocene, how can we hope to escape an anthropocentric view of the places that we live? Mm -hmm. hmm. Also good questions. I've got a question for you after this. <laughs> okay. um, I don't really have an answer to that. I've seen this discourse that people wanting to say, let's stop this period of the Holocene and change it to the Anthropocene. And I admit that I'm, uh, I'm a bit amenable to it, that it makes sense to me. Uh, for 10,000 years, we human, some humans have been farming, and we've got into a positive feedback loop of intensifying agriculture and population growth. 10,000 year positive feedback cycle, and it's changing, it's turning into a negative feedback cycle in our lifetime. Uh, and the students' lifetimes. By 2050 or 2060, world population, which has been growing forever, um, most models say will peak and start to go down. Uh, Non-renewable resources, post-peak oil, uh, going down. And so it makes sense to me that we are in some ways in an anomalous age, especially since World War II, that could deserve changing this major geologic, name of our geological era to an Anthropocene. On the other hand, I worry like 500 years from now, will, will we think this was a, some kind of self-important, uh, you know, silly thing and that every century has something new. So I'm not quite sure where I, where I sit with it. I'll leave it up to viewers of this to think what they think as well. And my question is, what do you think of your, for your own question? Um, I worry about it. I feel like I've spent a lot of my career uh, as an eco-critic in particular mm -hmm. trying to get people's eyes off the human actors mm -hmm. on the stage and to the stage right, itself. Right. And um, that that's to some extent what's happening through this, mm -hmm. um, through this assignment, through this deep history. Uh -huh. So I think my suspicion is if we all embrace the notion that we live in the Anthropocene, um, it's impossible to make sense of that uh, without right. an anthropocentric bias. So I'm worried right. about that. We, I see uh, your point. Mm -hmm. we, we, we love to hear stories of ourselves, tell stories of ourselves to right. the exclusion of other things. And I think that's part of the problem. And, and one thing that's happened, instead of being self-congratulatory about humankind, it's, oh, look what we've done, but we're still the center of the stage right, exactly. by, by this new term. Good. Well, we should wrap that up for today. Um, so thanks very much, and we'll be back to talk with you next week.